not because so much Jesus is going to be cheated, but you're going to be cheated of Jesus. And the more you come and you drink in the good news of Jesus, the more God moves you in a deep and mighty way. Hey, we're excited that you're here today. We're going to be taking a look at a beautiful text that's going to, I believe, stir in the hearts of every man and woman, boy and girl in this congregation today. And uh, before we do that, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to dismiss the kids. But before I do that, who here gets Youth for Christ peaches? Raise your hand. Come on. Yes, yes. Most of you. Uh, and, 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 you know, I've got, I've got a horse in the game because every year for many, many years, there's a special someone that buys some peaches for old reverend here, and they're sitting on my counter. Of course, my son Levi sucks about 12 down before I get my first one. But we don't want to miss the peaches from Youth for Christ. And guess what? Tuesday morning in the mall parking lot, they're going to be here. Victory people will be the first ones there. Secret. You got to get there first. Tuesday morning, grab your peaches, Youth for Christ. Troy's going to be there. And uh, they're the best peaches in town. We want to get those peaches. So uh, everyone, be forewarned because they go fast. Those peaches go fast. Last year we ran up to get a box and Troy said, "Uh, we just sold out. But we should get more by the end of the month. And uh, you just got to be there early. The next thing we've got is we have King's Kids. Maddie, knock her out of the park. Kids, pre-K to second or third grade, you are dismissed for King's Kids. Dismissed. Where's our daughter? <laughs> Looking. We just went and got her yesterday. She's not still in Langdon. Is she home? She's awake. She's here. Good. I'm glad to hear that. <laughs> Scaring me, dear. So it's good to have you in the house of God today. We're going to um, take a look at a text that um, I heard preached when I was in seminary, and I'm going to use the example. It won't be perfect, and some of you can probably check me out on the source because you know the guy that this happened to really well. Pastor John Kildy. I'm telling one of his old stories, and it it rocked my world in seminary, this story that I'm about to share. But before I do that, I need to read the text which I'm going to preach on today. It's found in the book of Colossians 1, 13 to 20, and I read it in the name of Jesus, our Lord. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authority, all things were created by him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together, and he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile to himself all things, rather things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Here ends the reading. So I'll never forget, I walked into chapel one day and I looked to see who was going to be the speaker. And the speaker was Reverend John Kildee. Many of you know him. And he stands up just before he preached, and he grabs this little uh, cushion that looked very much like this. Now, who all here has witnessed a boat cushion that's got the loops on each side? Raise your hand if you've ever seen a boat cushion like that. Have you ever seen one of those things? They, when you're out boating, and you, they, it floats. Well, it just so happens that That particular year, John had a little 14-foot aluminum, you know, five-horse putt-putt boat, and he took a buddy of his out on a little lake over in Fergus Falls area, and they were fishing maybe one Saturday afternoon. I don't know what day it was, but they're out on the lake, and Pastor Kildee talks about how they went out, and it was a perfect day. And it just so happened that he had to run out and purchase this little flotation device because the Minnesota... DNR changed the new rules and they said, if you're going to have a boat and you're going to be out on the lake, you at minimum have to have one of these little seat cushions to float, uh, to to sit on. And so Pastor Kildee 
went and bought one of these little flotation devices that looks very similar to this. They get out on the lake, they start fishing, it's a beautiful day, no wind, no mosquitoes, no anything, they're just having a good time, and they saw off in the distance kind of a blue wave coming at them. And they're like, oh, I wonder what that is. Uh, by the time they had a chance to react, uh, the waves picked up, the wind picked up. There they are out in the middle of the lake with his little teeny 14-foot boat. And these waves were coming at him. He said some of them five feet high. And uh, they started the boat. They got it going. Some water splashed on the boat. The engine died. Before he knew it, the whole thing turned sideways. The waves were splashing against the boat. He tells his uh, buddy to throw on a life vest. And as John's starting to look for his life vest, the next wave hits the boat, flips the boat upside down, loses all of his fishing gear. Boat goes down, couldn't see his buddy. There he is sinking to the bottom of the lake. That's the story of Pastor John Kildee. He starts swimming back as fast as he can. And as he's swimming up, wouldn't you, wouldn't you know it? Right there above his head as he's coming back up out of the water is uh, this little thing floating right there. And so he pops his hand through the water. He gets his hand through the, through the one loop. He gets his hand through the other loop. And then he pulls it to his chest. And he lays there and he holds on to that hollering for his friend who he never did see, fearing that he had drowned. But the good news is the friend had got that life vest on and got it zipped up. And the friend floated to shore because it wasn't a very big lake, really within minutes. But John was out kind of in the middle of this lake. And the friend ran up and talked to a person who owned uh, a cabin and a big boat. And uh, they fired up the big, big boat. And they went out in the big waves. And before too long, uh, someone was reaching down in their the, 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 out of the big, big boat that wasn't having any problems with these waves. And they pulled John out and uh, brought him to their home and dried him off. Of course, his boat kind of resurfaced because it had little floaty things in it. But he got rid of the boat. He said no more boating for him. <laughs> and um, he recollected that morning in seminary how one little tiny piece of foam about a foot and a half by a foot and a half with a couple straps on was the very thing that rescued him from losing his life for surely he would have died that day. One little teeny piece of foam. He had been faithful to follow the rules went and purchased one at the local sporting goods store, put it in his boat, and never believing he'd ever use the thing, the very first time out, it saved his life. Today I want to talk to you about God's spiritual flotation device that was sent by God to every single one of us and here's why. Because God in his infinite mercy knew that because Adam and Eve bit the apple, sin came into the world. And every one of us are born in sin. And because we're born in sin, we have the propensity to lie, cheat, steal, to do things with our thoughts, our eyes, our hands, that is utterly wicked to the core. How wicked? So wicked that when we do things that are a sin against God himself, God says that I can have nothing to do with you. And these particular things in which you're guilty of are so heinous to me, I'm going to have to separate you from me for all of eternity. That's why there is a heaven and there is a hell. And the Bible says broad is the road which most people will take that leads to hell because they never, ever believed in that beautiful little picture, that flotation device that God sent that's hovering right above every single person in church when they hear it, which is the promise of God, the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, the hope that God could save you from your sin. You see, God is sending a promise. He's sending a flotation device, if you will, to each of us 
But he does it in a unique way, you see. In our text today, we see how God rescues us. Colossians 1.13 tells us, for he has rescued us. Notice the word has. What does that mean? Well, Jesus has already come. He's already come. He lived, he died, and he rose again. He came because he knew in advance, he knew your struggles, your sin, your pain, your sins, your hurting. He knew that he would have to do something on your behalf. And because he sent his son, no matter how strong, fast, brilliant, creative, or accomplished we are, because he sent his son, he gave everyone the opportunity to be moved by the Holy Ghost, to see their sin, to see Christ's work on the cross, and have the opportunity to follow Jesus, and to be rescued by Jesus, and to trust Jesus. You see, it's called being born again. You're born into this world, into this sinful, wicked flesh, and then the Word of God, the power of God, the resurrection of God comes through the Holy Spirit to shake your world and to help you see that narrow is the gate which only a few take that's going to get to heaven. And for those who put their faith and trust and hope in the Lord Jesus Christ, they will be rescued from the, from the eminent darkness which is coming. We're going to see this in the text. Jesus came to rescue, point one, he came to rescue us from darkness. Now today reminds us of how this darkness works in us. You see, in John 10.10, 10, it says, the enemy has a hold on this world and we can see the effects of his work. He comes to kill, steal, and destroy in John 10.10. 10. Without Christ, we are living in darkness. Many of us see things happening around the world today. We see things happening in our own community. We see things happening on social media. And we find such great frustration. Why are we so frustrated? Well, the reason why is because if you have been born again into Christ, you see that there is a right and a wrong, a good and a bad, a darkness and a light. And without Christ, we're living in darkness. Spiritual darkness that influences us in dark areas. F.F. F. Bruce, a theologian we had to study in seminary, said this, the sinister forces marshaled against Jesus for uh, de de deceptive combat, which is what the devil is always trying to do, goes against Christ in the heavenlies. In the spiritual realm, he calls it a directional darkness where he knows your weakness. He knows some of the lineage of your forefathers' weakness and, and the things that your, your grandmas and your great-grandpas and, and, and people in your past have struggled with. He knows your struggles, and he starts to send directional darkness your way so that he can trick you, trip you, and make you think that the blood of Jesus cannot be effective for this particular sin. So you give up and you move on walking in this darkness. And how do we know the best way to live? Well, we find that Christ has come to give us an opportunity to trust in him and grow in a deep relationship with him, to give our lives to him, to be washed in the blood by him, to be rescued by him. And how to overcome the struggles in life is only through him. And Jesus gives us his guidance through his scripture. And how do we come out of that, 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 that darkness? Well, first of all, we need to realize that if we've been going to church all our life and we've been living in kind of a numbness to sin, we've been living in a religious darkness. The devil can cause you to be blind in a religious darkness or a directional darkness where you find yourself trusting and walking in things that, that, that are really useless and hopeless and helpless because Jesus said, with, with your mouth you confess me, but your heart is far from me. You don't have any desire to truly walk in the light and trust God, you really want to just embrace your sin. So how do we worship, love, and serve God? Well, we are in darkness. We need to admit that. We need to confess that. We need to realize that that's the spiritual warfare that's going on in our hearts and minds every second, every day. And we are in darkness, and we are surrounded by false ideas nonstop. Amen? 
And our own spirit, our own soul is hungry for more false ideas. Because the Bible says your greatest enemy is the devil, the world, and your, say it with me, your flesh. Your flesh wants it. But when your soul is washed in the blood, it's hungry for something else. It's hungry for truth. It's hungry for light. It's hungry for love. It's hungry for kindness. You see, the soul that's been washed in the blood says, I don't want any more darkness. I want goodness, not kindness, love. Ephesians 5.8 says this. says that you were once in darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. So live as children of the light. For once... There was darkness that had a hold of you. But now the light shines through you. Why? Because you have come to that place where you recognize, I don't have a little bit of darkness in me. I am dark. You see, you can't be saved. You can't be born again. You can't trust Christ. God can't rescue you until you recognize that you are the lowest, dirtiest germ in the world under the carpet rug. That's me. That's where I live. There's nothing good about me. I I have no chips to bargain with God. I'm hopeless and helpless before God. When we are so broken and we cannot do anything but cry out to God, God says, done. My scripture has done it for you. You are washed in the blood, new in Christ. I am bringing you into this revelation, this hope. You see, Jesus is rescuing you. That's the truth of what God is doing. He's rescuing you. And today, you're going to get an opportunity to hear how the pardoning words of rescue actually happen. I've got five other points in this sermon, and next Sunday, you're going to get to hear them. 